On today's episode, a new Starship launch tower at Starbase, plans for gigantic telescopes on the moon, and NASA's Mars helicopter is dead? SpaceX is looking to double the size of their existing launch and landing site at Starbase, Texas. The company is in the midst of a land deal with the Texas Parks Department, as construction on a second Starship launch tower has already begun. At the heart of this new development is a controversial exchange of land between SpaceX and the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. Basically, SpaceX needs to sever more land from the Boca Chica State Park in order to build their second launch and landing zone. We've already seen pieces of a new Mechazilla Tower coming together at Starbase, so we know that this is the company's intention, but we also know that there is not enough space on their current footprint to double up on all of that infrastructure. In exchange for the launch site expansion, plus some additional land up near the village, SpaceX is offering up an even bigger plot of land further up the Texas coast near the town of Laguna Vista. There's a long strip of undeveloped coastline and an adjacent grassland that is currently owned by something called Bahia Grande Holdings, which we can assume is an Elon Musk-owned shell corporation. So that's 477 acres of prime real estate being offered up as a trade for 43 acres of relatively useless scrubland that is already attached to a rocket testing facility. Elon is trying to make them an offer they can't refuse. We know SpaceX has been preparing to build a second tower at the Boca Chica site since parts began arriving in November of last year, with some particularly large parts arriving by barge from Florida in December. Adding to that, construction in the launch area has gone well beyond just preparing the current launch tower for a potential February test flight. The entrance has been expanded into the new Mars Gateway, and one of the suborbital test stands was completely demolished. So all SpaceX needs is a little more space to build their new tower and they're set, right? Well, it's not so easy. Before the land swap can go forward, it has to pass a committee, which means the environmental interests are going to do their best to get it shut down as they do. Now, to get out ahead of that opposition, the Texas Parks Department staff has already recommended approving the swap citing, quote, increased public recreational opportunities, including hiking, camping, water recreation, and wildlife viewing, and allow for greater conservation of sensitive habitats for wintering and migratory birds. The vote on this issue was supposed to have been held on January 25th, but has been put off until a later date in order to give people more time to prepare to argue about it. That's a paraphrase. But even if the bureaucracy rules in their favor, SpaceX still has a daunting task ahead of them to build out their Texas spaceport. The real issue is the location. This stretch of coast is mostly made up of soggy wetlands that Boca Chica is known for, meaning that at the very least, the Army Corps of Engineers are going to need to survey and sign off on construction here. After that, SpaceX is going to have one hell of a time making sure any new concrete pad built there could stand up to the punishment of a Starship launch. The water will have to be drained out of the ground, and then structural piles will have to be drilled and rammed into the bedrock before any concrete slab can be laid down. And then, only after about a month of cure time, can they actually start building the new structure. This part will probably be a little easier than the first tower though. SpaceX has learned some very valuable lessons since 2021, and so they're more likely to install the deluge system first, for instance. But the way they've been designing their towers has changed too, with pre-constructed sections being used in their tower at the Kennedy Space Center proving to be a huge time saver. So even if the tower ends up being slightly larger to accommodate something like the Starship version 3, it should still be faster to build. Regardless of the time it takes though, SpaceX is definitely working towards expanding their launch area, and that means there's going to be a lot of construction happening in between test launches this year. As for the rest of the land, it seems probable that the company will look to expand their little village of residences to go with a new retail area that SpaceX filed permits for on January 12th. That makes for a pretty busy year, but if everything goes smoothly, we might be able to spot a double stack of starships in Boca Chica by next December. An international group of over 12,000 scientists are asking the United Nations to create a series of legal standards 
that would protect certain frequencies and even large areas of land for the use of astronomical study from the moon. The International Astronomical Union's petition to the UN is centered around the need for the spacefaring countries of the world to regulate the use of radio frequency spectrum and some areas of the moon's surface, making a sort of scientific preserve. That sort of legal protection would require the weight of at least the UN countries to uphold and also intends to work with non-governmental organizations to get this treaty level agreement. The policies involved wouldn't be too different from the current legal framework that keeps Antarctica a more or less shared continent. The IAU scientists are mostly concerned with setting aside specific wavelengths of useful signals to work within the lunar sphere of influence, like the ultra-low frequencies that are used to study the early universe. But they are also attempting to get protections for historically significant sites like the Apollo landing zones and some extra land for their scientific instruments. And the types of instruments they're planning on building up there aren't small either. Enormous gravity wave detectors like the LIGO facilities and gigantic infrared and radio telescopes like the old Arecibo installation that used to stand in Puerto Rico. Those are the sort of things the IAU wants to build up there. Because as you might imagine, there are plenty of reasons to spend resources on this sort of thing. Observatories and gravitational wave detectors are likely to be more sensitive on the moon, picking up more data. Even with our current Earth-based equipment, humanity's knowledge of the universe has grown by leaps and bounds over the last half century, but scanning for distant objects, life, and potentially intelligent signals would be much easier without Earth's background noise. Since the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, there won't be any interference for the equipment to fight. No atmosphere also means that there will be less heat buildup on these installations, and of course one-sixth of Earth's gravity would allow for larger structures using less material, so aside from the trip there, you have the ideal environment to build some very powerful observatories. An international endeavor would also share any findings amongst the scientific community, and making use of programs like NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services Initiative could leverage several private launch providers to help in setting all of this up. And as the Artemis missions plan on establishing a more permanent human presence on the lunar surface, there could even be the chance to build specific crude facilities for scanning the stars. This ask seems like a no-brainer. There's plenty of space on the moon and acting to set up an Antarctic-style treaty agreement before things get too crowded on the moon seems like the easiest way forward. On January 25th, NASA Administrator Bill Nelson took to the podium to announce that Ingenuity, the Mars helicopter working with the rover Perseverance, has finally broken down. Nelson explained that on January 18th, the flying robot left on what was supposed to be a brief pop flight, a 30-second jump going up about 40 feet before heading back down to the surface. Just after it hit the ground, NASA lost communications with the little helicopter and was forced to divert Perseverance to head closer to the last known signal. After some time, the ground team was able to re-establish contact and snap this picture with Ingenuity's onboard camera. From the image, it's clear that there has been some damage to the tip of at least one of the carbon fiber rotors. The current working theory is that the propellers must have struck the ground as the robot came down, but regardless of how this happened, it's clear that Ingenuity will not fly again. Mars has an atmosphere about 1% as thick as Earth's, and Ingenuity's four propellers were designed specifically to use as much air pressure as it could to see if flight was even possible there. And, as it turns out, the Jet Propulsion Lab at NASA makes one hell of a flying robot. This last flight was Ingenuity's 72nd flight since being deployed from the belly of Perseverance when they landed back in 2021. Back then, NASA had only planned on making five test flights, and it completely destroyed those expectations. Remember that communication to and from Mars takes roughly 26 minutes, so Ingenuity had to fly and land all on its own, and it flew again and again and again. It even started running as a scout for the slower Perseverance rover. The success of Ingenuity has already changed a lot of the mission design for planetary operations at NASA. The sample return mission that Perseverance started has been amended to make use of Ingenuity-class helicopter drones after the success of the original. 
We recently talked about Maggie, the Mars Aerial and Ground Intelligence Explorer, which plans on using a large vertical takeoff plane with solar paneled wings to make scientific measurements from the air. But really, these examples are just the start. Now that the space industry knows that flight on a world like Mars is possible, it opens up far more wide-ranging possibilities for fast surveying of other planets. It's just a shame ingenuity is grounded, but it was only the first.